Welcome to uh, the, uh, the next in the uh, NMS inaugural lecture series. Um, and it's a real, a real pleasure and delight to uh, have the inaugural lecture for Elaine uh, Chu uh, now. Um, and one of the things that we've always said about these inaugural lectures is that we want uh, the, 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 the new professors, or the, the professors not so new, but new King's professors, um, to talk a little bit about their journey and, and how they've how they've arrived at, at this point. Um, so there's a sort of personal aspect to it as well. Um, and, you know, in Elaine's case, I, I just have to say, well, what a journey it's been. Um, so let me just tell you uh, a little bit about, about Elaine. So Elaine is a, is a joint appointment between the Department of Engineering um, and the School of Biomedical Engineering and Ag Imaging Sciences. So, so she's split over both sides of the river, but uh, what a great uh, thing to do. Um, she's an operations researcher and a pianist, so, so she's a kind of a split location, split personality uh, kind of uh, professor. Um, she's got a really interesting uh, sort of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary background. She, she, had her, she received a, a Bachelor in Arts and Sciences um, <clears throat> in uh, Mathematical Computational Science and uh, Music Performance from Stanford. So that's where her uh, undergraduate journey started, uh, followed by a Master's and PhD from, uh, from MIT in operations research. Um, now, then the journey continues. So, so prior to, to joining King's, um, she uh, started off at the University of uh, Southern California from 2001 to 2011. Um, she then moved to Queen Mary, where she was the professor of digital media uh, from 2011 to 2019. She spent a year or two in Paris before seeing the light and, and joining us up at King's, which we're very delighted to have Elaine now with us. So Elaine is a very, as I said, a sort of very diverse uh, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary person. Um, she's a, a pioneering uh, music information researcher, forging new pathways between, uh, between music and cardiovascular science with that very healthy, dense dose of uh, engineering uh, glue that holds it all together. She's a PI on two uh, major ERC grants, Cosmos and uh, Heart FM. Um, and she's been massively recognized by uh, the community, having these awards from the uh, European Research Council. She has a Presidential Early Career Award. Um, she's been recognized uh, by the NSF um, and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard. So it's a real pleasure to invite uh, Elaine up to the platform now, to, or uh, well, more than to the platform, to the, to the, uh, to the performance, I guess, um, to tell us about her journey and her science. So welcome, Elaine. Thank you. Actually, before Elaine starts, one last thing. Um, the, the vote of thanks at the end will be given by uh, Zoran. Um, as says Barbara Sholok, unfortunately, is, is um, uh, ill today and can't join us today. So the vote of thanks at the end will be by, by Zoran. But over to you, Elaine. Thank you very much for the amazing introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming and for taking the time out to, to be here today. And um, let's see, here. <laughs> That's the beginning of my uh, inaugural lecture. And um, today I plan to go through some of these items on the agenda. I'll uh, give an introduction to my background uh, because this is about the journey and how I came to be here today. Uh, then I'll speak about uh, music te uh, technology research that I engaged in early on in my career and um, some work towards automated composition that then led to the making of music from heartbeats. And uh, finally, I will uh, move on to some of the music expressivity research uh, I've done with my uh, research groups. And uh, finally, a cardiac response to live music. So I, um, I, I've seen a few inaugural lectures and they tend to be uh, more of a personal story. Uh, I wasn't quite sure how far back to take it as a background, but I thought I would start at the beginning. Uh, I was born <laughs> in uh, Buffalo, New York, uh, near uh, Niagara Falls. So here's a lovely picture of the falls uh, in New York State. Um, but soon after that, my parents moved. Uh, my, uh, my dad was a, uh, 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 an academic. It was his first job as a mathematician at 
SUNY Buffalo. So uh, then they moved to Singapore, uh, where we got to grow up with my mother's family. And uh, I'm very thrilled today that uh, the little baby up there, my little sister, is here today, uh, sitting here, and you can say hello to her afterwards. Uh, she's all grown up now and, um, uh, and uh, has an amazing career in her own right. Um, while we were in Singapore, uh, we of course grew up with many mathematicians. Uh, this is the mathematics department in Singapore uh, at the Nanyang University in 1973 and 1974. So all the people we knew around us because we grew up on campus were also mathematicians or children of mathematicians. Uh, so I thought I was going to become a mathematician. You know, I was surrounded by mathematicians. My dad was a mathematician. Guess what his third brother was? Also a mathematician. Guess what his fourth brother was? also a mathematician. Guess what his second brother was? A high school mathematics teacher for about over 50 years, and all of them married other mathematicians. So, um, you know, it fe seemed like it was my fate to become a mathematician. Uh, but to their surprise, I was actually turned out to be good at piano. And so this is my piano teacher. Uh, and so I actually, uh, um, and to his surprise, uh, he sent me to some piano competition, uh, sort of the, the first national, uh, international competition in Singapore. And uh, to his surprise, I actually ended up in the finals and I got to play with the Singapore Symphony Orchestra. But that was as far as, as it got. Um, because soon after that, I returned to the US for my studies. And uh, so I went to Stanford near San Francisco. And uh, I had the privilege of studying music uh, with Judith Bettina and Jim Goldsworthy, pictured here on the bottom right. And uh, that's my, uh, actually I got to know them because of my um, uh, roommate, pictured here on the bottom left and I ended up accompanying all of the singers uh, at, that were in uh, Judith Bettina's uh, studio. But at the same time, I was studying mathematical and computational sciences and got to work with um, George Danzig, who, who is known for having uh, come up with the linear programming algorithm. Uh, and so it was actually very um, exciting to be working with uh, Danzig and I, I was basically the programmer implementing and testing an, uh, a new algorithm uh, or rather an early interior point algorithm that he had modified uh, to actually converge. And um, after my undergraduate studies, um, I went uh, uh, to MIT where I uh, discovered a very musical community. There were lots of uh, musicians and uh, I was able to play music at a very high level and to engage with uh, other musicians, uh, other students who also played music at a very high level. Um, pictured here on the bottom right is Marcus Thompson, who was in charge of the Advanced Music Performance Program and the, um, uh, and the Chamber Music Program. So he would assign students to groups to play. Uh, and um, we got coached by uh, fabulous people like John Harbison pictured here, uh, who, had a, um, who had a world a premiere of his uh, cello concerto that he wrote for Yo-Yo Ma. And so he invited Yo-Yo Ma to campus. So we got to play with Yo-Yo Ma. Uh, so that's my 15 minutes of fame. And <laughs> so uh, meanwhile, I went to MIT to study operations research. So I also did some computational research. I started out with um, nonlinear optimization. Uh, and uh, I did that for, uh, I think, the first year. And then uh, that was the beginning of computational biology. And so I thought that was really cool. And I was going to learn about DNA sequences. And this, uh, this was uh, when the genome project was beginning. And so I did that for a bit, but uh, with uh, James Orlin as a supervisor. Uh, but then that project stopped. So I then found uh, another project in computational finance because that was what was starting at that time. And so that was the beginning of the field. So um, 
clearly I'm not doing computational finance today, but uh, the fact that I saw these people starting out in new fields, uh, so taking what they knew in operations research and applying them in uh, sort of a, a brand new area uh, fearlessly uh, was very uh, exciting and it was really thrilling to be part of that and uh, to go into an area where we didn't know what was going to happen. And so that taught me a lot about um, uh, as you can see, going into new areas of research, and uh, that was um, that was part of my graduate uh, experience. Um, I mentioned before John Harbison and bringing Yo-Yo Ma to campus, but I also got to work with composers. I worked with uh, Peter Child, who at that time was head of the music department, uh, music and theater arts, and. Um, I got to, uh, so these were experiences working with composers as they were creating music and being part of that process. Uh, when I was um, preparing for the performance uh, with Yo-Yo Ma here, uh, John Harbison would sit at his score and he'll go, oh no, not that note, and he'll scratch it out and he'll change it right there. And I thought, you can do that? And so that was, um, it was very, interesting to see the creative process unfold and the decisions that the composers were making. And um, because of the work with um, John Harbison and, now, uh, and then Peter Child, who became a collaborator for many years, uh, and um, we rec uh, rec I recorded several of Peter's pieces. Uh, Peter wrote a set of pieces for me based on songs from my childhood. So I'm going to play you one of them. Uh, they're a bit unusual. Uh, they're based on songs from my childhood, so they are, uh, they, they have a good melody, but they're not your usual pieces of music. So this one is, um, oh, did I mention my childhood? Uh, yes, uh, I forgot to mention this. Um, I, I come from a family of overseas Chinese, so these are, we are people of Chinese descent who have been out, outside of China for uh, generations. And so um, when my great grandfather on my mother's side first went to Indonesia, so this is an Indonesian song uh, that was written by Gesang on the bottom right here. And it's about the, the longest river in Java. It's um, uh, the Bengawan Solo. But if you go to Singapore, the Bengawan Solo is a very famous cake shop, but it's actually a river in Java. And a river in Java that um, uh, is very beautiful, and this is a song about the beauty of that river. So it goes like this. Bengawan Solo, riwayat mu ini, sadari dulu jadi perhatian dewi sari. Uh, and so on. But I'm going to play the piano version. It doesn't sound right because the right hand is in one key and the left hand is in a different key. So the right hand goes. And the left hand goes. And the right hand is... When you put the two together, this is... 
this is what you get. Uh, so, you know, beautiful lyrical pieces are overrated. We want some edgy pieces. So this is why uh, these are bitonal pieces. They have two different keys clashing. Um, and so uh, in music, the key is actually a very uh, important thing to give coherence to a piece of music. And uh, people in artificial intelligence uh, have been trying to find automatic ways to detect the key. So in that case, that was two keys at the same time. But let's try to get just one key. Um, and this was a very early algorithm for finding key uh, by Longit Higgins and Steedman, where uh, you have this arrangement of pitches on this grid, and you look at what shape it takes for, of given all the pitches that you hear. So this is a major key. This is a C major key. And this is, this is a, uh, oh gosh, <laughs> why did I pick that one? Hmm. Hmm. Is that? Yeah, yeah, it is uh, F minor. <laughs> okay. So uh, that's the F minor shape, uh, but actually if you shift it around, you get other minor keys. If you shift the uh, major key shape around, you get other major keys. And this was how they detected what key the pitches were actually inferring uh, when you hear a piece of music. But uh, if you look at this grid again, um, and this is where we get to my uh, PhD thesis, you will realize that, oh good, there's, there's a D over here. And there's a D over there. And if we wrap this shape up, if we take this sheet of paper, if we wrap it up, we're going to get a helical shape. If you trace all the pictures as you go around, you get a helical shape um, that is shown uh, on the right. Uh, so that is the pitch class helix. And because we're now in the pitch class helix, this is in three dimensions, no longer in 2D planes, uh, we have an interior space. Okay, an interior space means there's now more opportunities to actually gather the notes and represent them as a point inside this 3D space. And so um, what uh, I did was then, well, give, given that we had these trying um, in the previous sheet, there were triangles that represent triads, chords, uh, now we still have triangles, but we don't need to represent them as triangles. We can use the interior space uh, and in interior point and the triangles to represent each chord. And if we have consecutive chords, uh, we, three consecutive chords, we have, which you can harmonize hundreds of tunes. If you've seen that YouTube ad, you can learn hundreds of tunes right away by learning those three chords. You can harmonize all of them. And that's, uh, and that's because those three chords in the key uh, encapsulate all you need, all the, all the notes in that key. So, the, so each time we aggregate and use an interior point to again represent a higher level structure. And so we have layers of helices. So this is an array of spirals. So this is called the spiral array. We have the pitch class helix. We have the major chord helix. We have the major key helix. You can do that for the minor ones as well. And so this was the basis of my thesis, uh, which is a new representation for tonal constructs in 3D space. Uh, it was later, many years later, written into a book. Um, and uh, you would think, well, who would care about that 3D space? Who would care about finding key? Uh, but luckily for me, just when I graduated, uh, was when uh, music information research was emerging. It was just beginning as a field uh, because music recommendation was important. You know, since pieces are written in keys and the keys are very important for locating uh, pieces of music and understanding the constructs in it and how they relate to each other, uh, there was a place for my research. I didn't really plan it that way, but uh, it was good that um, this allowed me to continue in music information research. And uh, this was when I, uh, well, my first major academic position was in Los Angeles at the University of Southern California. And I joined the Integrated Media Systems Center, which was 
uh, looking for someone in music and engineering. So lucky for me, <laughs> I was at the right place at the right time to begin a career in music in an engineering school. And so this was uh, Los Angeles. Um, pictured here are some of my colleagues from USC, as well as uh, musicians I got to play with, uh, who were fantastic musicians in the LA Philharmonic. Uh, they, um, and uh, I also met Alex Francois, who is also here today, my husband, uh, who uh, took that spiral array and turned it into an interactive, real-time key-finding uh, object. So this is how it works. So as pitches are heard, they get mapped to the space, and the closest triad lights up to show you what key you're in, uh, a chord you're in, and the closest key uh, there's a rhombus around it, uh, shows you what key this piece is in. So we're able to track uh, what the pitches are, the chords are, and the keys are at the same time. Uh, this is a piece by PDQ Bach. Uh, if you know PDQ Bach, he's the forgotten son of J.S. Bach. Not really. He's a real person, a real composer who calls himself PDQ Bach and who writes uh, music that parody uh, J.S. Bach. So this is um, pretending to be Bach, but uh, with a modern twist. That would never happen in Bach's time. <laughs> okay. Uh, because of this work, uh, we got to go to the Radcliffe Institute uh, as uh, a team uh, to work on analytical listening through interactive visualization. Uh, and uh, I showed the app uh, in many different scenarios, uh, in performance as well as uh, in a video for the LA Philharmonic. And um, at, in Los Angeles, I continued to do more work, building other t uh, with um, other engineers, working on um, uh, on the left here. Uh, this is a distributed immersive performance. This is at a time when uh, it was, well, it still is a problem, having people play uh, across the internet with delay. So how much delay can you tolerate before the ensemble breaks apart? So we tested that with simulated delays and with uh, these two amazing players, the Toshev Piano Duo. Um, on the top right is um, the Mimi project. The Mimi project is about um, uh, human machine improvisation. So this was quite a while ago where, uh, I mean, today that's still very important, uh, where a human and a machine play together in dialogue uh, in an improvisation. And the difference in the, uh, the app that we had was that there was visualization. The visualization allowed the player to plan for what's coming and to reflect on what they did. So uh, that was the uh, interesting twist on the usual. And uh, on the bottom right is the driving interface for expressive music performance. So if you play a gigantic instrument like this here, and you're pressing pedals, and by the time you know the piece of music, all you're thinking about is how to manage tempo, loudness, and other expressive parameters. You're not thinking about the notes. It's like driving a car. Right, so, uh, so we turned it into a car driving interface so that it could speed up and slow down. And, um, and uh, we showed it at the, um, an exhibition, I forget, it's the 125th anniversary perhaps of the university. And um, so th there were all these young and old, uh, here we've pictured here some children, but we also had very elderly people come and play with the driving interface. Um, and for, for these series of projects, uh, I was a, able to go uh, 
I was received an award for the research to to go to the White House, and at that time it was George W. Bush, and shake his hand. Um, okay, so now London. So moving on to London. So this was when I uh, moved to London after Los Angeles. Um, and uh, I came to join the Center for Digital Music. Uh, this was at Queen Mary and uh, met many uh, lovely friends, some, met, some of whom are here today. You will see these faces in the audience um, and also uh, encountered other composers. So this composer, uh, Cheryl Francis Hode, was she had just written this piece called Haydn's Stolen Rhythm. She took a Haydn piece, stole all the rhythms, rearranged and changed all the notes. So it kept the same rhythm, but all the notes were different. So it was a new piece, but underlying it, the rhythm was Haydn's. And, uh, I, and uh, similar to this, uh, I also continued to collaborate with Peter Child. Uh, he, um, he and Lina Vista Grunley, um, asked me to practice music and record my practicing. And he turned that into a piece of music that was notated for someone else to perform. So this is what he turned uh, the notation looked like. wasn't actually me practicing, it was actually me sight reading the piece for the first time. Because Cheryl had written a piece based on this, I thought I should go see what the original piece was like. And so I was sight reading it and I recorded it. So imagine if you were saying something, giving a speech for the first time, and someone wrote down everything you said, every stutter, every stumble, every repeated sentence. This is basically what happened. Um, and this was, uh, it was shown and we, we did performances at exhibitions. Okay, so um, let's see. Okay, now going back to the spiral array, uh, we're going to use the spiral array to help us in generating music. So you, you've seen how new music can be made uh, from existing rhythms. Uh, but it needs to be guided somehow, the content, the context. And so in the spiral array, when uh, a note is out of context, you will jump very far away. So that will be a big distance. Okay. So as you can see, when we have a big distance, uh, there's greater dissonance, there's greater distance from the current context. And so we can quantify here the diameter, how much space you take to as a proxy for dissonance, um, how far you've moved from one chord to another as uh, a distance of how much you're moving in tonal space, and here how far you're stretching away from the key. And so we have here different measures showing the Tristan chord, a famous a dissonant chord, and the distances that it spans uh, according to these three measures. 
So um, Doreen Hermans uh, did her Marie Curie postdoc with me and um, took this and used it to constrain music generation. So she would um, first take repeated patterns in an existing piece of music. Okay, first of all, we copy the rhythms. So the same as before. But now, in, on top of the rhythms, whenever a pattern is repeated, uh, it would also repeat in the new generated piece. And, on, and beyond that, if the original template piece had a particular profile for each of the three measures of tension, harmonic tension, then the new piece must also follow that. And um, this was done with a heuristic, a meta heuristic called variable neighborhood search. And this is the original piece. And this is a generated piece. Um, the problem with AI-generated pieces often is that it doesn't have long-term structure. So we avoid that problem by borrowing structure from existing pieces. So this is uh, a music generation algorithm. Uh, we generate other pieces like for Elise, uh, eine kleine, uh, no, eine neue für Elise. Okay. Okay, so you get the idea. Um, we even got a string quartet to play a piece that was generated. Uh, and it did quite well against a human composer. Okay, at this point I'm going to segue, because we have to get to the cardiac stuff, and uh, into how we, I got into the uh, cardiac, uh, re cardiovascular science research. Um, so uh, it turns out that um, since I was a child, I had an arrhythmia, which would uh, usually happen when I was uh, swimming, uh, and that uh, it, it got uh, to a point where I was told I should get it ablated. So I went and got it ablated. So it was ablated uh, not so long ago, some years ago, and, um, and then I lived happily without arrhythmia for two beautiful years until I got another one, and it was very debilitating, and I wasn't able to do anything active for many months, uh, until it was again ablated. But while I was in the cath lab and looking at these beautiful screens, I'm thinking, this looks a lot like music. I love these signals. I want these signals. And so after the procedures, I asked for signals from, um, uh, from my cardiologist, and I started mapping it because these are rhythms to music, right? So we take template rhythms and we put music to it. This is what a uh, ventricular ectopics look like, and this is another series of ventricular ectopics. So this is your heart going not quite regularly. A regular heart would sort of going thumb, 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 thumb. This is thumb, 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 thumb. And um, so this is uh, a sequence uh, taken from atrial fibrillation. So we have that rhythm, written it out as music notation, uh, and it can be performed as music. Okay, 
very musical. Uh, it makes for good music because it's physiological. So a lot of music rhythms, um, when it's in the score, are not as nice and physiological as that one. But when you actually have cardiac rhythms, they are very uh, natural because in music, uh, much of music timing tries to emulate a physical movement and physiological rhythms. So uh, because of this work, um, I asked for longer sequences to then turn into music. And I took a summer and went back to the Harvard Radcliffe Institute, uh, where I had three uh, research partners pictured here. Um, I, I thought I would be really, really demanding, and I required that these students have to be musicians, have to be either computer scientists or bioengineers, and they had to... Um, Oh, I forget. I know I had, there were like three different requirements. And then three students showed up. To my surprise, I thought I would maybe get one or half a student. And um, so they, they helped with uh, transcribing a much longer sequence in a, a taken from a procedure. Um, and uh, this is the uh, result of that transcription. And in fact, one of them said, well, this, this sounds like host. And I go, okay, sure, we'll take host and we'll map host to this. And this was the resulting piece. I played this without a metronome, just by looking at the score. And I was amazed at how well it matched the signal. Okay, so uh, musicians are very attuned to timing. Uh, and because what we do is manipulate time. And this is how much timing gets manipulated. These are um, maybe 40 to 60 different performances of one Chopin mazurka. Uh, the top shows the loudness in solos, and the bottom shows the interbeat intervals. So music has interbeat intervals, heartbeats have interbeat intervals, they're called RR intervals. Um, but there's more than that, they also share many different structures. Uh, in time and frequency. Uh, some of the work we did in order to extract these structures and to get higher level descriptions of these structures uh, include extracting where these curves are, where the edges are, where the beginnings and ends are. So um, this was the work uh, on uh, expressive performance. And at that point um, uh, was when I moved to Paris. Uh, to start an ERC project looking at computational modeling and shaping of exp uh, musical structures uh, as they appear and emerge in performed music. So music that is very physiological, music that is very natural sounding. And um, so I was lucky to uh, work at uh, IRCAM, which is part of the Pompidou Center. Um, and in a, in a research facility, if you ever go there, it's underneath the Stravinsky fountain. So the Stravinsky fountain is this crazy colorful thing, the spinning statues. But underneath that fountain, there are these teams of researchers working on music and science. So remember that when you go there and remember to look down because there's a, a row of windows where you can look down from the ceiling and, and see the research facility down there. Okay, so one of the things that uh, the team in Paris made was Cosmonaut. So Cosmonaut is um, a web-based um, visualization and annotation uh, platform. Uh, it was designed for citizen science, so easy to use, so everyone can actually participate in showing what it is they hear in music. <clears throat> yes, okay. So 
Here's an example. Uh, this is uh, Pierre Boulez who started the lab. We can see the loudness curve. Uh, that's the audio. That's the notes being played. Uh, this is the tempo. Uh, I think those are, I'm not sure those peaks are correct. Ah, okay. That was the 30 second piece. Uh, now we hear a longer piece of music. Ah, before we hear the music, let me talk about something else. Um, so, we are interested in the music, but we're interested in what that music is designed to do. So, um, and I started working with uh, uh, um, Pierre Lambiazzi and with um, Peter Taggart, um, who were interested in autonomic responses. Uh, in this case, was a, a research study that uh, Peter Taggart had led uh, that looked at movie clips. And he had people who are just still on the table, lying down and having catheters inside their hearts, uh, monitoring their hearts, and he had them signed and agree to watch a harrowing movie clip. So they watched this movie clip uh, um, over on the bottom left here, and uh, it's from Vertical Limit. If you've watched Vertical Limit, just watch the first two minutes. Uh, it's a, it's about this family that's hanging by a rope and about to fall to their deaths. And in the end, the father actually dies because he's yelling to the son, cut me loose, cut me loose, or we're all going to die. And, um, and in the end, he, they do cut him loose and he dies and they get saved and, and then the movie progresses from there. So this is what they are, the patients are watching. And you can see that they're, um, so they're measuring not their heart rates because their hearts are paced, and so their heart rates cannot change. Um, but they, th these are their uh, activation recovery intervals, so how quickly their heart recovers to be ready to beat again. So when you're stressed, that recovery period gets shorter and shorter. And so they're watching this movie clip, and at the beginning, it was the recovery period is quite relaxed. In the middle, it's less relaxed. By the end, it's quite small. And so um, you can see the reaction to stress. And so uh, we designed another set of studies, not with a harrowing movie clip, just with music, which was um, perhaps a little less extreme. And um, this is, oh, I did bring the music. Okay, so this uh, this is Chopin's Ballade Number no. Two, which begins. So it's it's very lyrical, but then somewhere it, it then goes to this. Okay, so um, the audience might gets this a big jolt uh, at that point, and uh, this is what we see. Okay, so this is, you can see that big jolt happening in the audio, and um, this is the activation recovery interval of one of the patients that came, a pacemaker patient, who's agreed to have the data pulled from their device while they listen to this live performance. And um, you can see that just when the, the, uh, the music crashes, the ARI goes down. And uh, later on, 
after that frantic period, um, the main theme comes back. And so you see that high point over there. Ah, okay, we're back again. So um, this is uh, uh, um, this is uh, yeah. You can see that's the andantino beginning, presto con fuoco, and then tempo one, meaning the andantino comes back. And this is the loudness and tempo and how they change at that point. Um, so the, these are measures of. Uh, uh, music parameters overlaid uh, on it is the ARIs. Okay, so as a result of this study, uh, we wanted to scale up the number of people we could have. It was not easy getting pacemaker patients to come in. It involved a large team, a lot of people, um, and willing patients who actually show up. So uh, we then went on uh, because we got some funding to uh, try to build an app to collect data and also uh, to model uh, the responses uh, to music. And so this was um, the Heart FM project. And uh, here we have the music the example that I will show you. Um, this is the music example from Strauss Burlesque. So it begins uh, quite strongly. So that's where that red line is on the left. And after all this frantic bit, And then in the end, when you come back to um, where you don't know what's going to happen. And now... And then the orchestra sweeps in. So this is a really lush period. And... Um, we have here uh, the listener's ECG, the listener's RR intervals, the listener's RMSSD, that's the heart rate variability. So if the heart rate variability is low, the listener is stressed. Um, and this is the player's RMSSD. So uh, the player's stress at different points in time, because if you look at this, the player is starting to relax the green line. Um, meanwhile, the listener is quite relaxed, but then this is where the tension increases because we don't know what's going to happen. And so the listener is feeling the stress more at this point. <laughs> I 
meanwhile, the, you know, the, the players already uh, off to uh, having a good time. Okay, now then the listener starts relaxing. Okay. All right, so here we go. And finally, the last example uh, was, uh, oh, okay, from Paris. I came to London and I joined King's uh, last July. And so here we, uh, uh, we, we had a, a, uh, an event at um, the Science Gallery London uh, where we had Dennis Noble be our, uh, being our principal listener. So he came and uh, if you've watched his uh, videos of him giving the lecture on the music of life, he always begins his lectures with this piece of music. And it's a trio by Schubert, the Andante con Moto, from uh, uh, his, uh, the trio Opus 100. And um, Dennis had not heard it live, or if he did, he couldn't remember it. Um, so it was a very special occasion for him because he opens his talk with that piece every time. But this is, and this is a piece that means a lot to him. And so we had him uh, uh, listen to the music live, uh, to the trio. Um, two thirds of the trio are here today, uh, our violinist is sitting in the audience. And um, we have here uh, the signals uh, from Dennis, uh, his breathing, and I think that's the RMSSD. And the breathing becomes more ragged when he was asked to speak, but during the music, it's beautiful. So I'm going to show you uh, Dennis's breathing and then encourage you to actually breathe along with Dennis uh, on this part of the piece. the last example of the talk. Um, I've been very fortunate to work with many wonderful people. Uh, I'm sure I've missed some, so uh, forgive me if I, if you don't see your name up there. And um, thank you very much for taking the time to be here uh, to attend this talk. And this is the official ending slide. Hello, I'm Soran Svetkovic. I'm Deputy Head of the Department of Engineering for Research, and I would like to thank Elaine uh, on behalf of the uh, Faculty of Natural Mathematical and Engineering Sciences and the Department of Engineering for this very inspiring uh, talk. 
uh, Professor Barbara Scholleck, the head of the department, uh, is sorry that she's unable to attend because she's not feeling well, but she sends uh, her regards and congratulations. And she and all of us are really delighted to have you in our department. Again, really thank you for sharing. What a fascinating journey. What a fascinating and inspiring research um, leading to uh, nobody mentioned yet uh, to the really very prestigious award, uh, um, Falling Walls Science Breakthrough Award for 2022 to Helene for, for her research on the relation between, uh, between music and heart rhythms. Thank you so much. So uh, I would invite you now for, uh, to, to, to drinks and uh, to ask questions, which I'm sure there would be, there would be many uh, after this fascinating presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you.